guys, welcome back to the Why the Hell Am I Here podcast. I am super excited for today's episode because we have an out-of-towner guest with us today. His name is Collier Landry, correct? Yes, I yes. pronounced it correctly. Yes, you did. And he is here to talk about, well, for one of the things we're going to talk about is a documentary that um, is premiering at the Cleveland Film Festival this weekend called A Murder in Mansfield. And uh, we're going to get into how we made the documentary and the story behind it and all that, um, because this is the Why the Hell Am I Here podcast, and we talk about how you know you come to be where you are in life and this journey of life. And uh, you're not living in Mansfield currently, but you grew up here. I did, and had something very significant happen to you here, which we're going to get into. Yes, we are. So welcome to the Thank podcast. So I'm glad much. you're Thank here. You. Thank so. You really. Uh, I know that we were talking on the way here that you just flew in from LA, right? I did. So, and uh, it's snowing outside, so that's. <laughs> it is snowing, <laughs> but I but I'm fine with it. I'm, I, you know, <laughs> it's funny because in the documentary I talk about, I'm always kind of complaining about the weather, but um, <laughs> but it uh, like I'm acclimated to it. I love yeah. it. It's you know, it's it's something very cool. Yeah, I, I guess you know you. You did grow up here, so it's not like you're not used to Ohio weather and the, the craziness of that. And so. we, get, we get cold in L.A., trust yeah. me. <laughs> well, okay, what's cold to you in L.A.? Well, here's the thing. <laughs> you know, here we have the the cold, and it's kind of that sort of, it's chilly. You're chilly. You're like, oh. In L.A., it catches you by surprise because <laughs> it's like 80 degrees. Then if it gets down, it, like in the winter... It'll go from 75 or 80 degrees at night to like 45. Like that's a huge swing. <laughs> that is a big So you just kind of like, I always describe it to people that come out because it's just it, like you're not expecting it. <laughs> sure. You go, oh wow, it's 44 degrees. It's like holy crap, cold. I need a coat. <laughs> well, Collier, um, you know, I talked about you grew up in Mansfield. You were actually born in Philly. Is that I right? was born in Philadelphia, yeah. Bryn Mawr. Yeah, and then you moved to Mansfield at around age five. Yeah. Um, and actually lived in the house next door to next the door. house that we're sitting in right now. Yeah. So we're sitting in uh, our my managing editor, Larry Phillips, his house on Hawthorne in Mansfield, Ohio. And uh, yeah, you grew up, uh, what? do you even remember the address? Or like 616 the Hawthorne Lane. Boom. 616 Hawthorne Lane, then I grew up at 808 Cypress Drive. Do you remember like being a kid and growing up and running around this neighborhood? I love, you know, it, it's... <sighs> It's funny because we don't have neighborhoods like this unless you have tons of money in Los Angeles. <laughs> mm-hmm. But we're just, it's just it's this huge city, right? And, um, but I remember like being able to like run across the street and go down through that neighbor's yard, who I don't even know, <laughs> and go to another house and then another house on the other street and just being able to like roam just anywhere. Right, yeah. You know, I mean, within reason. I mean, my mother <laughs> would be like, don't go down at the end of the street there, don't go down, you know, uh, what I don't know what the road this is. Uh, Woodhill, maybe? Woodhill, yeah. or Trimble, or something. It was T Bones. But she was like, don't go down there at all. You know, but I used to just, yeah, this was like my <laughs> whole playground. Yeah. You know? Were there a lot of kids in the neighborhood? So there was, uh, there were older children in the house that we're at right now. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, I was by myself. Um, my best friend growing up was Tony Tipperman. His father, Dr. Tipperman, used to live like, like a few streets over, but off of Woodhill or mm-hmm. whatever road this is right here. <laughs> Um, so sometimes he would come over, but, and then the, uh, across the street, they had kids as well. So uh-huh. yeah. And everybody would come over here and, you know, kind of play and yeah, all that. Yeah. And it was, it was cool. What's was, one thing that you remember the most about your childhood, like the early days? Um, you know what? I, I'm, I'm somebody who really loves the outdoors. Yeah. And I just remember like playing out in the yard, playing laser tag and <laughs> you know, running around playing hide and go seek. Yeah. Those are things that I really kind of cherish. It's fun to be an outside kid when you're growing up. It is. For sure. It is. So up until like around age 11, you had a pretty normal childhood, right? I did. Like for well, the most I mean, part. <laughs> I had a somewhat normal childhood. I mean, my yeah. father was never around yeah. and um, I was always with my mother and my mother mm-hmm. would kind of like, you know, schlep me everywhere, <laughs> everywhere, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, so that's how I grew up. Mm-hmm. You know, um, but yeah, it wasn't, it, it was as normal of a childhood as one could have, I suppose. Yeah. So you said you have a pretty close relationship with your mom growing up. Yeah, your mom I was Noreen, right? Yeah. Um, what's one of the things that, I mean, do you have a specific memory with your mom growing up that really sticks out? Um, not specifically. Yeah. Um, 
My mother was very supportive of me in summer school. Mm -hmm. I would go to classes at the art center. Yeah. You know, so she was somewhat supportive of my artistic ambitions, uh, which was really cool. Um, but I just remember just, you know, going out with her and just, just kind of being her little sidekick. Yeah. Like you were together yeah. a lot. Went then. to Kosai all the time. Oh, and, fun. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this is all leading up to this event that happened when sure. you were 11 years old. Let's talk about that. Sure. Um, tell me what happened then or what you remember from, it was, what, this is December of 1989, right? Yeah, 1989, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, I mean, for those that don't know uh, and why I'm back here, is um, in, on December 31st, 1989, my father murdered my mother in this house right next door to us. Um, and my mother went missing as a missing person for 25 days. Um, but I knew she was dead when it happened. Yeah. Um, I heard, I was woken up by a scream by my sister, and then I heard things going on. My father passed my door, I saw his footsteps, I didn't look up, because if I looked up, I probably wouldn't be here. And um, I testified at trial for two and a half days. Yeah. Uh, when I was 12. I mean, I can't imagine hearing that happening in your house. It had to be a scary night, oh, that night of December 31st. Of course, yeah. Um, what's the feeling that you remember when you woke up and you kind of knew that something was going on, but you didn't know what? Oh, I was terrified. Yeah? I was terrified. Things were really bad in my household the last three months of 1989. Mm -hmm. Between my parents, they were getting a divorce. My father had a mistress. Um, she was having his child, you know, it was just, which I didn't even know at the time. <laughs> right, like, yeah. You know, it was just massive drama. Mm -hmm. So, um, things were tenuous, to say the least. So, you know, my mother had made jokes of, you know, if your father kills me, this is where he's going to take me or what, you know, I just thought they were jokes. Yeah. <laughs> and she made references. Me, you're 11 years to, old. Yeah, I was 11. You, know, it's, you, you don't think about those things when yeah. you're a child. Um, and you shouldn't think about those things in general. <laughs> right. Uh, but, um, but yeah, um, it was pretty intense the last three months of 1989. What about the aftermath? I mean, you said your mother was missing for almost a month after this happens. Um, I mean, as a kid, when you are living in this house and your mom's not there, I mean, what was that like, the aftermath, you know, after it actually happened? Well, the aftermath in the household mm -hmm. was very strange, very strange. Um, you know, my father, you know, for those that don't know the case, my father transported my mother's body from Mansfield to Erie, uh, uh, Mill Creek, which is a suburb of Erie, Pennsylvania, where he had bought a house that he was going to live with with his mistress and then wed, um, to you, you know transport her there and then buried her underneath the basement of the floor <laughs> of the floor of the basement. Mm -hmm. um, so he was gone a lot in that time period. Sure, you know, and my grandmother, his mother was at the house and she was you know, a natural friend of us um, and very friendly with my mother, but she was trying to kind of manage what was happening in the household and didn't know what was going on and their son is gone and he's setting up a new practice, which he was always setting up practice in Erie, but she thought he was gone for those reasons mm -hmm. and it was not the case. Yeah, as it turns out. Being so close with your mom, was that hard to, like, all of a sudden she's gone? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the funny thing is, is that, or not the funny thing, it's not funny at all. The thing is, is that when my mother was not there the next morning, I knew in my heart she was dead. And that was something when I, you know, called all the friends and I sounded the alarm bells, you know. Because my mother was always by my side and never left me. So for her to just all of a sudden be gone is not 
Yeah, kosher. you knew that you she wouldn't just leave. Yeah, exactly. on her own. Exactly. Exactly. What at one point? So she was missing for twenty five days. Yeah. When did things start happening, like with law enforcement getting involved? Law enforcement got involved. I think law enforcement got involved on January the second is yeah. when the police officers first came to our house. Maybe January first, but I think it was January second was the initial officers that came up and they they came into the house and then they they kind of separate. My grandmother wouldn't let them in the door. They they finagled their way in. Whatever. <laughs> um, I remember taking. I remember specifically taking one of the officers aside and saying, "Hey, um, I don't trust my father as far as I could throw him. Something's wrong here. My mom is just not missing." The weird thing is, is it did not not occur to me that my father could have killed my mother, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it wasn't unfathomable to me that he could have done this. Like, I was like, oh yeah, he could have totally killed her. In the matter that he did it and what he did, n no. But the fact that she was gone, yeah. I mean, there were days where I was, um, you know, searching... Uh, the house, pulling out bookcases. We had these bookcases installed and going into the crawl space and looking for a body and you know stuff that I would talk to the detectives about or Dave Messmore about. And um, yeah, it's crazy. So let's skip forward a bit to the actual trial. Sure. So you're 12 years old at this point. Your dad has been charged then for with... Um, yeah, I think he was charged. He was arrested on, I think, January 25th, 1990 yeah. at the house. He had come back and they snatched him up while they were right after they pulled the body out of the house in Erie. And uh, yeah, he was. Charged. And you testified. I did. What was that like being 12 years old and testifying against your dad for your mom's murder? I mean, these are things that I just keep thinking like, you're only 12 years old and to have to go through that, no, no kid should have to go through that. And you did. And I mean,. What was that like? Look, nobody nobody wants to experience that. Right. It's very tough. Um, but it was something that I had to do. And I talk about in the film a little bit about this, you know, I'm I don't regret testifying against my father. What I regret is that it had to be my father. You know what I mean? Um, because nobody wants to grow up in a household like that or think of their father in that way, even though I didn't like my father. Um, well, you cannot like your father and you yeah. know expect it's, that it's he quite shouldn't between, commit murder. <laughs> it's quite different between my father is a bastard versus my father is a murderer of yeah. like my mother. Yeah, that's not you a know. fine line. <laughs> yeah. Um, after, because obviously he was convicted. Sure. After that happens, I mean, how do you go back to having a quote unquote normal childhood after this happens in your life? I mean, you go, you go back to sort of having a normal childhood, if you will, because of the love and the support of the community around you. Yeah. It's something that, uh, it was really a driving factor. You know, I was adopted into a good home. Um, my friends were still here, I was still in the community. And there was a lot of love and support, and that's one of the beautiful things when you when you come from a small town. You know, you go, "Why the hell am I here?" You're here for those reasons. The community, you know, they rally around you, and it's a really amazing and cool thing. And needed, I would think. Yeah, I mean, when your whole sure. life feels like it's falling apart, and it kind of is. Yeah. Um, graduated from Ontario High School then. Ontario High School. 
Warriors. years later. Uh, then you went to Ohio University, I right? Did. And what did you study there? Music. You studied music. Yeah. Vocal performance. Vocal. Po- oh boy, we're gonna have to have you sing later. No. <laughs> and uh, so then, where did? Because okay, spoiler alert: you're a cinematographer now. I am. Yeah. So. Uh, where did that start factoring into your life? Well, so in high school, you know, I did music. Uh, I was in the Rainbow Choir, and, you know, I didn't get into that until I was uh, late in my sophomore year. Mm-hmm. But I also uh, took a photography class when I was a uh, junior because mm-hmm. you could take photography, and um, it really resonated with me. So I moved out to Los Angeles, and I had a career as a model, and I worked as an actor and did certain things and anyone in the entertainment industry understands that you kind of jump around from different positions as you're feeling it all out so I had a um, I had a studio and and uh, I used to do uh, projects with very well-known artists mm-hmm. but then my studio was robbed by my business partner and I lost everything and Great. I just <laughs> it was like the welcome to LA story everyone <laughs> but by the way like that experience is not unique oh, <laughs> like <God. laughs> everyone Everyone in Los Angeles has one of those stories of just like, yeah, I came and somebody robbed me and, you know, just yeah, I lost my ass. And sometimes they go home and sometimes they stick it out. I stuck it out. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had a laptop. I learned how to edit, taught myself Final Cut Pro at that time and uh, got into editing videos and then got into shooting videos. And I was like, oh, I met some people. I got on some sets and then I realized that oh, I could have a career shooting people, you know, shooting photographs. So I was like, well, I traded one passion for another, but I could still make a career out of it. Mm-hmm. So I've, I started working professionally as a cinematographer probably in um, 2013, end yeah. of 2013. And, um, and uh, I just got in the union last year as a DP nice. and uh, I had to local 600. Yeah, it's great. So the other thing, too, I think it's important to mention is, you know, we hear when you're reading about the case, you hear like Dr. Boyle, Dr. Boyle. Sure. And you are no longer Boyle. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was I was adopted when I was 13 by the Zigglers. Um, and so I changed my last name was legally changed to Ziggler. Um, but I go by Collier Landry because Landry is my middle name. And when I moved to Los Angeles, <laughs> Ziggler is a very... Uh, Jewish name <laughs> in the entertainment industry there's lots of Jewish people yeah. um, so uh, people would always assume that I was Jewish and I said you know what I'm just gonna cut <laughs> cut that off because I'm not Jewish and I won't explain <laughs> it I'll go by Landry but it's twofold because my mother always wanted me to be a lawyer really <laughs> and every time that I was in trouble she would say call your Landry so I thought, well, when I move out here and I'm doing the entertainment thing, she probably wouldn't be as supportive as I would <laughs> hope. And she would be like, call your Landry. So I thought, oh, it would be a great way to pay homage to my mother. So That is a Hence, universal mother thing, to yeah. whip out the middle name when you're in trouble. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's what I think. So anyways, that's where the moniker call your Landry comes from. So while you were out in LA, that's when you had this idea to make a documentary based on your childhood experience here in Mansfield. So how did that come about, that idea? So originally, it wasn't really a documentary that I wanted to do. It was originally a, um, a pilot for a television series about the consequences of violence. And in 1999, I saw a film called American History X, which stars Edward Norton, Edward Furlong, uh, Beverly D'Angelo, Elia Gould. And that film is Edward, um, Edward Norton's character plays a neo-Nazi who kills a black guy who goes to prison, gets completely reformed in the, in the prison system, realizes this was like, what was I doing? Like a neo-Nazi, like I'm nuts. Comes out of prison and sees his brother traveling down the same path with the same people and the hate and all that stuff and tries to save his brother from that life just says this is not the way to do it this is not the way to go but it's about the consequences of violence and unfortunately his brother gets killed by a black kid and by a black teenager who's you know trying to be initiated by a gang at the end of the film so it has a very tragic ending but it's about the consequences of violence and i thought Whoever did that movie, 
you know, should do my story because they they get they get it. They get the, the consequences of violence. So flash forward, you know, nine years later, I meet the producer of that film, John Morrissey. And I say, Hey man, um, I got this concept about a, about a series because a, a docu series because what I feel that we do is bad guy goes to jail, um, state gets his restitution, gavel hits next. So, anyways, that that film examines the consequences of violence in America, and that was really important to me, and. You know, I approached John, I said, look, John, I have this idea for a series that examines the consequences of violence. And the best thing is, is I own the rights to the pilot. And he's just like, oh, this is a great concept. I have a friend that I just shot a movie with for a first feature film, but she's a two-time Academy Award winning documentarian. And that's Barbara Koppel. And then that's kind of how the whole genesis of everything started. Mm -hmm. So that was like 10 years ago. Wow. And this whole idea of exploring the consequences of violence, you mentioned that, you know, this, what happens after, you know, the gavel hits, basically, right? Yeah. I mean, this is what you're interested in. And the aftermath. I mean, the original working title of this project was called Aftermath, and it's about the aftermath of violence, you know. Um, a murder in Mansfield is a little misleading because, yeah, it might grab you, but it's not about the murder. We're not, you know... We're not retrying the case sure. in the documentary. We're exploring the consequences of it mm -hmm. on the community, on the people that were involved directly, as many people as, could, as were willing to participate. Mm -hmm. so. And then obviously you starring in the film, that's, uh, I mean, obviously we're exploring the consequences of violence on one person's life. Too. Sure, okay. sure. That was not always the original intent yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at all. Um, it was more of maybe me shooting it, you know, and interviews and things like that. And then when Barbara became involved and as things progressed, she said, this is the, the best story, you know, because she's an amazing filmmaker. Right, so, yeah. It's knows. nice that she had that vision. Yeah, so, yeah. So... What was it like then, you know, once you decided that you were going to be in it instead of behind the camera to revisit all of this and go over and talk to all these people again? Well, it was, um, it was interesting because, again, I was not prepared to do that. Right. Um, but it was, the whole process in general was cathartic, you know, to really get through the trauma of what happened so because had you really thought about it in depth before that i mean i had thought about it a lot in the sense of how it affected me and the community but i never envisioned that it would play out the way it does in the film mm -hmm. if that makes sense yeah and not to give any not to give too much away but i mean the ending I haven't seen it, but there's a part in it where you actually confront your father, right? <laughs> Here, for those who are not watching the video, we have a big sigh. <laughs> and I can't, I mean, you'll have to go see it, I guess. I don't want to give it away. Yeah, I mean, there's a just, it's just, a, you know, I had, had a, I had maintained a relationship with my father over the years um, to try to establish some sort of normalcy. However, you know, he's always maintained his innocence. It was only until 2010, um, and John talks about this all the time, when, he, when I came back for his parole because he wanted me to testify to support his release from prison, which I agreed to do, and partially now I'll admit it, is because I wanted him to participate in a project like this. <laughs> and I knew that I could curry favor with him to do that. Um, so he, um, our relationship was very, the weather, basketball, girls, what, like mm -hmm. very, very, like um, surface level. very surface, very vapid, you know, and he's very manipulative and he's a, soci he's a sociopath. So, um, it was really hard to 
have any sort of relationship with him. Um, then he admits in 2010 to the death, causing the death of my mother. And that kind of changes the whole arc of my life, which kind of really spawns this whole project. Yeah. Wow. Um, and really kind of frees me up as a person and inside and, and my whole world changed at that time because I was very lost up until then. I was, you know, there was something that was always off. Um, but, uh, but yeah, when he did that and he, you know, he was like, oh, you know, well, anything you want to do with the, with the project and all this, I'll participate. So he was very eager to participate and he is given in the film um, a lot of opportunities to, to really account for what he did and to really admit what he did and um, you know people just have to see it but mm -hmm. now welcome. obviously we talked about it's at the Cleveland Film Festival this weekend mm -hmm. but you've shown it lots of other places up until or up leading up to this right I have it's been in probably like six or seven film festivals since uh, November wow that's so what's been the response so far the response has been really, really favorable. Yeah. Really, audiences have really responded well to it. Um, there are a lot of people that have seen the film that have been affected by violence or trauma in their lives that r that it, the film really resonates to. Sure. And that's a really cool thing because that's kind of w was my goal. That's yeah, that of, has that to feel good. Mm -hmm. So that feels really good. And it's, you know... And they share a lot with me, and it's really a mm -hmm. cool thing. How much of it, I mean, obviously you're making this film for for that purpose, you know, helping other people, but how much of it was made for you, you know, and to kind of help you work through this, you think? Well, I mean, the amazing thing is I was able to make this film, and... You know, not a lot of people get those opportunities to yeah. do that. And it was extremely cathartic for me because we were able to just do it, you know. And I'm so fortunate. I'm so grateful for Barbara coming on board, John being involved and, and orchestrating everything and uh, Discovery mm -hmm. for really, you know, saying we want to do this project. Sure. Um, but yeah, it's just been, it's just been an amazing an amazing project to work on to really isn't it crazy heal. to look back and like see how all of this came together to yeah. <laughs> to you know lead up to this project and now this kind of huge thing but obviously there's more to come right yeah there's more to come and it's just you know there's there there's future projects and it's, it's funny I always tell people you know the documentary is one thing but the making of it is way it's way <laughs> more interesting <laughs> you know, we almost didn't get into the prison to film. And I guarantee that the state of Ohio will not let me back into another <laughs> prison to film after what happened. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's just, there's, you know, it, it, it was just a cool experience. Mm -hmm. Sorry to re, <laughs> to go back. But, yeah, there's more things that are happening. Mm -hmm. Are they... Like, are you still going to explore this topic of, like, violence and the aftermath of violence? Yeah, I still very much want to um, want to make this into a series. And I'm thinking I'm toying with the notion of, of developing a series around where I go back with somebody and help them go through their journey on camera. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And deal with their demons like yeah. I did. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, you know, that would be amazing. To yeah, do. seriously. Amazing. Would you say that what happened to you when you were young is something that has defined your life moving forward? Or is it just something that, I mean, you did this whole project surrounding it. And I just wonder if you think it's going to follow you for ever. Um. I'm the most fortunate person I know. I really am. So I guess in that sense, 
no, then it's not. I've just been, to be able to tell the story, to be able to do what I do, to be able to have come through what I've come through. Yeah. Is it rewarding to be able to use this medium to then help other people? Absolutely. Yeah. Sorry, I'm getting all emotional. <laughs> it's okay. I know. Let's talk about something happy then. Yeah. No, 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 but, no but like, but that's, the, but that's the thing is, the, the thing is, is that, you know, as an artist, to be able to do what we do and tell the stories that we're able to tell, like, that's the best thing in life. It's just, it's crazy. I'm so fortunate to be able to have done this. You know, it, 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 as arduous as the process was of making the film itself and everything that I had to go through in my life to get to this point that where tomorrow night we're going to be screening in Cleveland or audiences around the world are really seeing this, to get it to that point, I mean, it's just it's amazing. I'm so, I'm so fortunate. I mean, you talk about why the hell am I here? I mean, like, why the hell am I here? Like, I'm, I'm here to tell stories. I'm yeah. here to help people. I'm here to, uh, I mean, I'm still here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, that in and of itself is an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. Well, Collier, I can't wait to see the film, first of all, and to see, you know, what happens next with your life and other projects and stuff. I mean, there's got quite the future ahead of you, I would yeah. think. So lots of stuff beyond this. Thank you so much for being here and talking about this. Thank and you for I know you. coming all the way from Thank LA and coming me. here for the screening, I'm glad you could make the time yeah. to come I'm talk glad with I could us. Be here. If you want to subscribe to Why the Hell Am I Here on Apple Podcasts, please do so. Or you can follow along with more episodes on richlandsource.com. And hey, follow me at Call Your Landry. Yes, yes, please plug your social media. <laughs> follow me at Call Your Landry. Um, all my social media is at Collier, C O L L I E R, Landry, L A N D R Y. Thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time.